inside the chattel wheels, Frog and his novices, who were safely sleeping in their protective cyberpods, soon were delivered to the outer level of the deep room. And as quickly as Frog could manage, he and his novices were moved from the shadow wheels into the elevator, which led to the second level of the deep room. No sooner than the elevator doors had closed, Frog, who had been anticipating this very anxiously, heard a small series of muffled explosions. These being, of course, the consequences of the combination of the now highly saturated petroleum distillates within the shadow wheels and several possible sources of sparking or igniting. And, although it was perhaps a small victory in a meaningless battle, Frog had once again avoided being exploded by the shadows during one of their wildly strange petroleum refining and bomb distilling parties. More importantly, not only were Frog and his novices safe, but also Frog's bongo drums were safe. And while novices certainly were more important to Frog than his bongo drums, he was nevertheless a bit fond of his bongos, and therefore was quite pleased that they had survived yet another shadow party. As the elevator slowly descended to the second level of the deep room, Frog studied the security monitors very carefully and, using his highly customized mind-machine interface, began to query the security system regarding every important parameter, measurement, and observation pertaining to the safety, isolation, and inner workings of the deep room. Even though each of Frog's deep rooms had highly elaborate security systems that spanned many dimensions, so long as Ilgon Ilgo continued virtually to be obsessed with its most unusual and puzzling desire to steal Ogly Nogly's beautiful black high heel slippers with cute ankle straps and open toes, there simply were no truly safe havens from anything in the very high dimensions because Ilgon Ilgo had discovered how to make ripples in the space-time tunnel, albeit only from the outside, not from the inside. Just as Ogly Nogly had its beautiful slipper, which actually was a most marvelous space-time vehicle, so did Ilgon Ilgo have a beautiful slipper. In fact, these two slippers were a pair, but the cobbler who made them was very careful to make each one just a little bit differently. And it was the differences in the two slippers which, when put to good use, enhanced the abilities of the slippers. However, because the cobbler fully understood the potential abilities of this pair of truly marvelous slippers when operated in tandem, one slipper was a tiny bit more powerful than the other, and it was the more powerful slipper that Ogly Nogly controlled. Ilgon Ilgo's slipper certainly was powerful, but it was no match for Ogly Nogly's slipper. In the early moments when the space-time tunnel first was set in motion, Ogly Nogly and Ilgon Ilgo were a duality that, in toto, comprised a functionality and authority which later became to be known as the keepers of the space-time tunnel, and even later transferred entirely to Ogly Nogly, who then became the sole keeper of the space-time tunnel. And in those early moments, which were long before anyone had imagined such marvelous things as a beautiful pair of black high heel slippers with cute ankle straps and open toes, the state of the art in cobbling was a simple pair of sandals, functional, comfortable, and conveniently airy. Ogly Nogly worked the inside of the space-time tunnel, while Ilgon Ilgo worked the outside of the space-time tunnel. Occasionally, they traveled in tandem, but most of the time, they worked independently to maintain the stability of the space-time tunnel. As time passed, which in the early moments happened very quickly, the cobbler increased his skill in cobbling and soon realized that the finest pair of shoes were a pair of black high-heel slippers with cute ankle straps and open toes, at least for the work the keeper of the space-time tunnel needed to do. While sandals and then boots certainly were functional, as the cobbler carefully began assembling the beautiful pair of slippers, 
in a true instance of brilliance, the cobbler understood what would likely happen in the far distant future so clearly that he foresaw the need for one of the beautiful slippers to be able to do something the other one would never be able to do. In some respects, this extra ability was a small and insignificant thing, but in other respects, it was the one thing which, if it were possible, and this appeared to be very likely, would make it possible sometime in the far distant future to be able to prevent a little mistake in the design and construction of the space-time tunnel from becoming a big mistake, one which otherwise might eventually lead to the collapse of the space-time tunnel. In the grand scheme of the space-time tunnel, by design, the real battle of good and evil was being waged primarily over control of Ogly Nogly's beautiful slipper. Because whoever or whatever controlled Ogly Nogly's beautiful slipper ultimately would control the space-time tunnel. And whoever or whatever controlled the space-time tunnel also controlled space-time itself. In a curious and perhaps puzzling way, the tiny difference in the two beautiful slippers was very simple. Specifically, Ogly Nogly's beautiful slipper had a glove compartment. And inside this glove compartment, which only Ogly Nogly's beautiful slipper had, was a little black book that fully described and clearly explained everything the beautiful slippers did, including how to maintain them and how to operate the various levers, both visible and invisible. But the key bit of information found in the little book stored conveniently inside the glove compartment of Ogly Nogly's beautiful slipper was hidden on the last page of the little book underneath the words, this page intentionally left blank. Of course, Frog knew nothing about the glove compartment of Ogly Nogly's beautiful slipper, the little black book, or the secret of the last page. But he certainly knew what happened when Ilgon Ilgo created ripples in the space-time tunnel. And Frog had no intention of being anywhere near any place where Ilgon Ilgo was creating ripples. As a time thread pilot, Frog used only a few of the infinite number of time threads that the space-time tunnel spanned. And while he could only perceive occasional glimpses of Ogly Nogly and Ilgon Ilgo, he was aware of them, as were all beings and life forms in one way or another. If he was doing something good and Ogly Nogly was in the area, then it became better. But if he was doing something bad and Ilgon Ilgo was around, then it became worse. And since Frog tended to be a bit of a scoundrel most of the time, he simply did not need more problems than the ones he either already had or was busily creating. At times, this bothered Frog deeply, but perhaps since Frog was a bit slow in some respects, his general response to being bothered entirely too much by philosophical thoughts was to play his bongo drums toward some goal of which Frog simply had no idea or vision at present. As Frog studied the information on the elevator's status display and continued to examine and to verify the operation of the deep room via his mind-machine interface, he became more comfortable in knowing that everything was in order and was functioning correctly in the deep room. Even though the elevator was very small in proportion to the shadow wheels, which to Frog were huge, at least in the lower dimensions, where Frog was no bigger than a tiny gumdrop or jelly bean, it was not so much the distance being traveled by the elevator as it descended toward the second level of the deep room that mattered. Rather, it was the dimensionality that was important. And while from one perspective, the elevator had traveled only a short distance in the lower dimensions from the outer level where the shadow wheels awaited, from another perspective, the elevator had traveled an enormous distance, not only in space, but also in time in the higher dimensions. Suspicious days I stand before
before you, the members of the Academy, it is with great honor and no lack of trepidation that I present to you, the members of the Academy, the complete unabridged results of decades of diligent research and study. Mm -hmm. Is there an absolute and fundamental unit of which everything is composed? What qualities would such a unit possess? How does quantity influence its description? Well, some may argue that in mathematics, for example, a point may be infinitesimally small. It seems obvious that at some time in the nanoscopic search for the exact dimension of a point, one must reach a moment of decision. The point either exists or it does not exist. If it does not exist, then it has no dimension. Otherwise, if it does exist, then it is of absolute fundamental unit, AFU, size one, and it has dimension. In much the same way, an AFU of existence, here and after simply called an AFU, will have properties analogous to a mathematical point. The major difference in terms of size is that in some types of mathematical systems, infinitesimally small is acceptable due to the abstract nature of the system being described. But existence in a physical system demands that there be a limit upon at least one quality. And it is the quality of existence. If a thing does not exist, then it has no size at all. But if a thing exists, then it must be, at minimum, large enough to possess the quality of existence. Therefore, I propose that an AFU has at least one dimension. The dimension of existence. How much existence is there? Is there a finite amount? If existence can be measured, can non-existence also be measured? What other qualities are necessary to describe physical things uniquely? In attempting to answer some of these questions, it is helpful to avoid the use of words like atom, electron, molecule, neutron, proton, quark, and so forth, as well as any references to the secret rules of virtually any local Alcor Muslaj, because such words and references imply links to define systems which currently are quite unable to supply us with all the answers insofar as we are aware, or in the case of those who count ourselves among the best people on earth, can reveal publicly at this time. Recapping at this point, we have an AFU, which has the quality of existence in some quantity in the sense that it can be measured. I further propose that existence is not subject to a threshold limitation, as for example, the perception of sound is subject to a threshold phenomenon. Additionally, I suggest that existence as a quality with quantity, as well as in terms of being an AFU, is an instantaneous event, discreet if you wish. This suggestion leads to the question, in what state is an AFU before it exists? Simply stated, an AFU is in an indeterminate state of non-existence, with no dimensions, including the dimension of time. Therefore, before it exists, it is absurd to say that an AFU was non-existent for two million years, while not completely excluding the possibility that a potential AFU could be in such an indeterminate state of non-existence for some small amount of time. It appears very unlikely that such is the case. In constructing a graphic picture of an AFU, I find it useful to represent the AFU as a tiny triangle contained within a circle, which serves as a logical enclosing boundary. No properties are presumed for the space occupied by the AFU other than the quality of existence. In other words, because an AFU of existence is contained within the space enclosed by the boundary circle, the space exists. Since by previous definition, existence is a discrete quantity, I propose that it also is an absolute quantity, in the sense that it is illogical to suggest that one AFU has twice as much existence as another. All AFUs have equal amounts of the quality of existence. This is the case because considering the possibility of AFUs existing with varying qualities of the quality of existence would imply that AFUs
views can combine or separate to produce other views. Nevertheless, I do not preclude the possibility that several views could group together to form a larger piece of existence. And this is consistent with my proposition that space is not an view, but instead is a region of existence. The next question to be addressed is whether existence is the only property of an view. If existence were the only property, characteristic or quality of an view, then the boundary of the view would actually be part of the view, and it would imply that by combining AFUs, one would be able to produce larger amounts of existence, something which does not sound very promising in terms of eventually constructing a rock and a tree. There must be something which uniquely distinguishes a rock from a tree. Hence it will not suffice to construct each one from existence alone, if for no other reason than avoiding the paradox of determining whether two things with equal amounts of existence were both rocks, both trees, a rock and a tree, or something entirely different. To avoid this potential paradox, I propose that there are at least two qualities that an AFU must have. In other words, that an AFU is binary. The second quality that an AFU must have is called character. And it comes in two flavors, present and absent, positive and negative, or butterscotch and peppermint, if you prefer. Furthermore, character is the secondary quality of an AFU, in contrast to existence, which is the primary quality of an AFU. Existence is absolute, discrete, and non-polar. In contrast, character is very low, not so discrete, and very polar, especially in the Arctic and Antarctic regions of our planet. Adding character to the graphic reposition of an AFU is accomplished by constructing a small circle containing a plus or minus sign and then placing this little planet of character in orbit around the triangular unit of existence. The fact that this construction resembles an atom is convenient, but not nearly so convenient as the fact that it is not subject to further division. Having two kinds of character, present and absent, positive and negative, or butterscotch and peppermint, enables us to construct two kinds of AFUs. One, an AFU with positive character, and two, an AFU with negative character. Or as we like to call them in the laboratory, butterscotch AFUs and peppermint AFUs. It now appears plausible to provide some mechanism for constructing things that exist on higher levels. Where does character originate? Is it really so unlike existence? In the sense that it is variable, not so discreet, and polar? I propose that existence can capture character, and that character must have a minimal quantity. Otherwise, we must allow for existence with no character, which makes about as much sense as a play with no actors, no actresses, and no anthropomorphic scenery. Furthermore, I propose that character is available in fundamental units, each of which has identical quantity. With these basic components, we construct blocks of AFUs. Whereas an AFU cannot have neutral character, a block can. When combining AFUs, which always have single units of character, the resulting blocks each have only one unit of existence, but two units of character. This is important to note because it is central to the ability of this system to change. At this point, actually at all points, there are only two types of AFUs. One, an AFU with positive character, the butterscotch AFU, and two, an AFU with negative character, the peppermint AFU. There are three fundamental types of blocks. One positive composed of one unit of existence and two positive units of character. Two neutral composed of one unit of existence, one positive unit of character, and one negative unit of character. And number three, negative composed of one unit of existence and two negative units of character. If you are observant, then you must be wondering what happened to the extra units of existence that were not used in the construction of these blocks. Says nothing or something must have happened to them because existence can be neither added nor subtracted. My proposition for experience
explaining what happens to the X-ray units of existence is to state that they must do one of two things. One, combine with a unit of character, which is to say that they must capture a free unit of character, or two, cease to exist. This proposition is central to the theory because it provides a mechanism for change. Furthermore, for simplicity, I propose that these types of blocks are the only types of blocks. If an extra unit of existence does not find a free unit of character, then what happens? Does it disappear? If so, does it ever reappear? Does the possibility exist for creation of another unit of existence to take its place at some later time? How much time does it have to capture a free unit of character? Is there a finite pool of either existence or character or both? Since I previously proposed that existence is an instantaneous event, an instantaneous event, some provision must be made for the implications that existence can travel from nowhere, which currently is dimension one, to somewhere the multi-dimension, more or less instantaneously, noting that nowhere therefore exists, which is quite consistent with the clearly observed rules that nothing is real and that nowhere is just around the corner in Gilbert space. The way this implication is handled is directly related to the next level of the construction, the combining of blocks to create planes which are composed of either two or more blocks, each of which comprises single units of existence encapsulated or bounded by two units of character. In one of three simple configurations, butterscotch, butterscotch peppermint, and peppermint. Or, number two, one block and one APU, which we call pistachio in the laboratory. This provides for the construction of planes having three or more units of character, while also providing for both balanced and unbalanced blocks. Since I am attempting to construct an absolute system, I will presume, number one, that there are finite pools of character and of existence, and number two, that while these finite pools are for the moment permanent, they may, under certain conditions, contract or expand infinitely. For the present, I propose, number one, that free existence searches for free character and appears instantaneously at the location of the nearest free character when there is one. And two, that when this occurs, it results in an instantaneous combination which produces an AFU. This last proposition appears to be in agreement with the fundamental laws of thermodynamics and with the general view of entropy or chaos in the universe. In other words, things must be constantly changing to allow three essential processes to occur. Number one, creation of more complex planes. Two, preservation of existence. And number three, primarily civil and orderly elk and bush large meetings. As blocks are formed, and in some instances, planes are balanced, existence must be free. Hence, if the pool is to remain a fixed size and is not to diminish into oblivion, then every time a unit of existence is free, there must also be a character which is either free or in the process of being free. In terms of priority, I propose that while character can roam around temporarily, existence cannot linger waiting for character to be free. And it appears useful to impose the additional restriction on these processes that, while it may be possible for an extra unit of existence to force a unit of character to be freed, this forced freeing cannot be done in the vicinity of the occurrence of the event which originally freed the extra unit of existence, at least without causing catastrophic consequences. Otherwise, nothing could change, or more properly, change could not occur. Now, I do not intend to disallow a forced frame of character in what is considered to be a spatial or temporal vicinity. But I strongly suggest that an extra unit of existence cannot force its character to rejoin it under ordinary circumstances. Of course, this implies that each extra unit of existence knows its own character. And I suggest that in its vicinity, this is true. Similarly, a butterscotch AFU does not easily become a peppermint AFU, and vice versa. This is true, at least in the sense that if no free characters are available anywhere, then somewhere there must be an AFU, an already present character, and existence combination, 
which is willing to dissociate so as to allow the pool to be sustained. In turn, this proposition provides some method of communication between units of existence, but not typically between units of character, a proposition which appears to be useful. By allowing for communication between units of existence, both extra and joined, the existence pool can be maintained by a kind of general consensus or mutual agreement, if you will. Although such consensus and agreement must be sequential and must follow certain additional rules, this also allows the possibility of expansion and contraction of the existence pool. Events which, although unusual, occur as a consequence of failing to maintain a fixed existence pool. Similarly, I propose that existence can change into character if doing so is the only way to sustain a necessary reaction. Noting, however, that doing so can have profound consequences and must be viewed as an extremely unusual event. Considering priorities, it must be added that character cannot easily convert into existence in an analogous event. The only event in which character can produce existence occurs when there is no existence in the pool. Then, and only then, can a combined consciousness of all character produce existence, a process which continues until existence itself resumes the burden of consciousness, and then whatever happens in the universe once again is no longer subject to the whims and fancies of butterscotch, peppermint, and pistachio, but instead is being sensibly governed by the Neapolitan flavors, chocolate, strawberry, and vanilla. For these purposes, it should be noted that both the existence pool and the character pool are in dimension one, or if you prefer, nowhere. When an extra unit of existence captures a free unit of a character, it is not in dimension two or higher, which can involve dimensional transitions. But the important observation is that nowhere, or if you prefer, dimension one is not the same as either the indeterminate state of dimension zero or the multi-dimension state of somewhere. In conclusion, I would like to inform the Academy that I'm not wearing underpants. slipper with a cute ankle strap and an open toe, from which Ogly Nogly was leaning forward and holding a sign which stated in the most simple terms possible, if you see this, jump up and down three times. Suggesting this was entirely too much for Frog to comprehend would have been an understatement, and as often happens when decisions are made in a split second without allowing sufficient time for thoughtful mentation, Frog's response to this was quickly to press the button that closed the elevator door, an action which he figured would give him a few seconds to ponder what he wanted to do, more correctly what he should do. After the elevator closed, Frog contemplated this surprising and somewhat frightening development for a moment, decided that a hologram really could not do anything much, and then pressed the button which caused the elevator to open again. As his mind was racing wildly in an effort not to be quite so surprised by whatever appeared in the hallway, when the elevator door opened, time appeared to move forward in very slow motion. And as the sides of the elevator door slowly moved apart, Frog's attention was keenly focused on seeing as much of the hallway through the space between the opening sides of the elevator door as was possible. In this slow motion state of greatly heightened awareness of space-time and danger, Frog's mind appeared to him to be playing tricks because in one instant he thought he saw Ogly Nogly hovering in his slipper, but in another instant he thought he saw Ilgon Ilgo. 
Like the sounds made by a string of exploding firecrackers, the images of Aglidocli and Gilgon Gilgo alternated rapidly in his mind, but Cloud somehow maintained his focus as the elevator door continued to open until, in what appeared to take an eternity, the elevator door was fully open and Frog stared wide-eyed into an empty hallway. Frog tried to keep from shaking with some success, at least until the hallway began to distort, slowly at first, but then increasing in intensity until it became apparent to Frog, on a very primitive level, that there was a space-time ripple traveling through the hallway, heading directly toward the elevator. Not knowing what to do, but having the common sense to recognize a clue when one is given, Frog jumped up and down three times and then waited to see whether this changed anything. To his great relief, the space-time ripple slowed a bit, and once again he saw a hologram of Ugly Nogly leaning over the edge of the beautiful slipper. This time, Ugly Nogly was holding a sign which gave Frog these instructions. Make a lot of noise with your bongo drums. Not knowing what else to do and being quite fond of playing his bongo drums, really, Frog grabbed his bongos and started making a lot of noise with them. As this was happening, Frog looked ahead, saw the slipper turn around, and then saw Ugly Nugly dive into the slipper and fly out of the open toe like a cannonball while holding what certainly appeared to be and Hilbert Space Guru. As this scene progressed, which it did very quickly, he saw a glimpse of what appeared to be two humans standing in the middle of an ellipsoidal transparent capsule. And these humans were diligently banging on a drum and a wood block with drumsticks. The noise grew louder until, just as quickly as everything had appeared, it disappeared. And the hallway now was completely empty, and the space-time ripple was gone. Being a practical sort of individual, Frog surveyed the hallway and instructed the security equipment via his mind-machine interface to check everything twice and then to check it a third time. When he was satisfied that everything was as near to being normal as he might at present reasonably expect it to be, Frog ventured into the hallway where he noticed a small object on the floor of the hallway which he immediately identified as being a drumstick. Since Frog tended to be as curious as he was practical, he reached down and picked up the drumstick. When the drumstick was in his hands, he rotated it slowly and discovered that something was written in tiny letters on one end. And this is what it said. Objects are larger than they appear to be. No sooner had Frog read the letters than the drumstick vanished into thin air. And for some reason, which he could not at present comprehend, Frog felt a great sense of calm and well-being. Whatever had happened was over, and there was a renewed sense of order in his world. Of course, Frog was a bit curious about the meaning of the statement written in tiny letters at the end of the drumstick. But his general view on this was that he did not need to be in such a hurry to understand everything that had just happened. He looked over his shoulder, confirmed that the novices were still safely sleeping in their cyberpods by noting the status lights on each of the cyberpods, and then continued doing what he had planned to do, which was to move the novices into the deep room where, if everything worked correctly, he could expose them to isolated time threads and corresponding lower dimension resonance. This causing the necessary perceptual changes to occur that would soon transform them into time thread pilot apprentices. In a different part of space time, Bakra and Suzanne were finishing their Coca Cola, popcorn, and good and plenty candy while thoroughly enjoying watching on the fourth dimensional drive in movie screen everything that Frog was doing. Before Ugly Nogly left in the beautiful slipper, Ugly Nogly handed Suzanne a small paper card, which on one side contained neatly printed instructions for returning to the engine room of the ship on the asteroid. And on the other side contained a diagram showing how to construct tomato hoops using concrete reinforcing wire mesh. And then Ugly Nogly leaned over and whispered into Suzanne's ear not only that she was to use her intuition to know when to visit the space-time tunnel again, but also that nothing beats a homegrown tomato. Next, with a wink and a smile, Ugly Nogly leaned back and waved to Barker and Suzanne as the beautiful black high-heel slipper 
with a cute ankle strap and an open toe zoomed away and disappeared into the vast reaches of what Bopper and Suzanne now realized was primarily straight ahead infinity, albeit trimmed just a little bit to avoid curving too much to the right.